Good evening, everyone. I want to thank everyone for joining tonight's webinar on triathlon-specific strength training. I'm Jesse Kropelnicki, the founder and head coach at QT2 Systems. Um, tonight's webinar will be interesting and I think very um, applicable for, for many athletes that are presently training for triathlon and specifically dependent on their particular demographic. Um, for some of the older athletes and or athletes with lower uh, lean muscle content, strength training becomes much, much more relevant and important in the overall training program, um, which is something we're certainly going to discuss here tonight. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm going to spend about 50 minutes um, going through the presentation and also going over some example videos, and then I'll spend about 10 or 15 minutes at the end of the call to answer any questions that come up. So if you have any questions as I go through the presentation, um, please enter them into your questions box that should be part of your presentation control panel. First, I'm going to run through the five QT2 cornerstones. First one is training. Second one is nutrition and restoration. We think of those first two as preparatory type activities. Third one is race fueling. Fourth one is race pacing. I think of those second two as execution related activities. And the last one is mental fitness. I think of those five coming together to form the race outcome. Tonight's talk and presentation is really focused on the training aspect related to strength training. So what is strength training? First of all, it can be lifting free weights in a weight room with low to moderate repetition. These are your traditional strength training exercises with compound movements using large muscle groups. Some examples here are squats, leg press, bench press, etc. Most people understand uh, this particular definition of strength training. It's the most traditional in nature actually being in the weight room and, and pumping iron, so to say. Um, Number two would be Nautilus type equipment at the gym. So everyone's seen that area of the gym and here it's using the machines to do exercises like seated chest press, uh, leg extension, hamstring curls, etc. Typically you could hit most of the same muscle groups that you do uh, in the free weight room except that you end up having a little bit of peripheral restraint uh, in terms of controlling range of motion and variability of motion and that in turn ends up not uh, taxing or stressing some of the, the typical stabilizer muscles that may be related to any particular larger move that you're doing. Um, next, and this is sort of an order of, uh, of, of stress, whereas the, the, what I talked about initially in the weight room exercise, extremely stressful, typically have heavier weight, and sort of are working our way down from there through Nautilus equipment, and now um, using some of the tools that you may be able to, to find at home. Okay. So these typical tools would be things like push-ups, pull-ups, uh, TRX, using stretch bands, so on and so forth, typically body weight based um, exercises. The next step here as we continue to reduce the force and overall stress is specific in-sport sessions. So this is doing low cadence work on the bike and, and most of you who are on the, the webinar have done this type of work at some point. Um, but low cadence work on the bike, hill bounding while running, and or paddle work in the pool. So those are the four definitions I like to use of strength training, and all of them are definitely strength training. The question is, when should you be doing any particular type of strength training that I have on this slide versus where you are in the season or what your objectives are? And uh, there's really no, just like everything in triathlon training, um, it, it, the answer is it always depends. So how long you spend time in any one of these particular types of weight training is really dependent on your particular situation and also where you include it within the season. So those are some of the things we're going to talk about tonight. Um, at the end of the day, as we move our way down this list, we are increasing sport specificity, which is an important concept to understand and it's something we'll continue to talk about here tonight relative to strength training. So what's the objective of any of the strength training that we do? In my mind, number one, it's to avoid injury. It's to develop that soft tissue toughness and durability such that later on in the training program, you're able to do specific sessions in training, more traditional sports-specific sessions like speed work on the track um, or tempo work running, so on and so forth, um, that actually do have a direct impact on your potential race speed. Um, the strength training allows you to do those sessions with do, which do impact race speed without becoming injured or, or beat up from them. Um, so that's, that's one of the initial um, important aspects of weight training. It facilitates the ability to do workouts later on that will be effective in improving your race day performance. 
<clears throat> uh, number two, conversely, is sport-specific uh, strength requirements. So this is the case where the athlete literally does have a strength limiter um, that is limiting them in the sport of triathlon. And a perfect example would be on the bike. So if we're talking about an athlete that has very low um, muscle tissue content um, and is weaker in nature, their ability to produce power on the bike, particularly maybe in the hills, um, could be directly related to strength deficiency. So this is where strength training will actually potentially improve race day performance. Um, you know, that's certainly the case when you are dealing with an athlete that has the lower muscle content, but in most cases we're dealing with athletes that aren't strength limited and the, and the strength program is really just there as a preventative measure and to provide soft tissue durability um, to avoid injury later in the season. Um, so the next set of objectives, and I've sort of um, separated these out into three categories, the ne next set of objectives um, is to develop that primary muscle um, strength. So that, that this is, uh, for instance, the glutes, the quads, the hamstrings, some of the primary movement muscles that are related to the sport of triathlon. Um, next in priority would be to develop the stabilizing muscles that allow you to engage the primary muscles without losing um, your mechanics or form. That's what these stabilizing muscles do. They're important when you do the weight training moves themselves. They're also important um, in your actual sport mechanics. Okay, So if you're lacking strength in a particular stabilizing area when you're trying to go through some of your sport specific movements, um, it doesn't allow you to get into mechanically efficient positions. Good examples for, the, for this would be uh, swimming um, and running, having weak hips running and or weak scapular stabilizers while swimming. Okay? It doesn't allow you to get your arm into a position where you can effectively engage the larger muscles such as the, the lat. Okay? Um, next in order here would be to develop tendon strength. Um, typical area here would be down at the Achilles. That's a common area of injury in runners and triathletes. So we're always trying to develop good soft tissue uh, tendon strength uh, in that area. So the weight training goes a long way to do that. And next it is to develop some joint flexibility. And, you know, triathletes are tremendously inflexible. Um, and in particular in the shoulder area when it relates to swim mechanics and developing good flexibility in those areas is important again um, so that we could get into mechanically efficient positions. It also helps um, guard against injury. So it actually does provide some injury resilience as well. So the whole purpose here is to develop these characteristics that I just talked about in a time efficient way without unreasonably impacting the primary sport activities. Now, obviously as a triathlete, um, you know, the primary amount of stress that you're applying in your training program is swimming, biking, and running because that, that's what will have the largest impact on race day performance. And here we're adding to it a strength training program. We just have to be careful at how much stress we use on the strength training program because at the end of the day, um, it's all about striking a balance, and this really is a stress budget. If we spend stress in the weight room, um, that's going to take away the availability to spend stress in some of our more sports-specific areas as we swim, bike, and run. Um, so it's all about striking that correct balance and not overdoing it in the weight room, doing just enough to get some of the characteristics I mentioned above um, without having a detrimental effect on our overall available stress budget. So it's all about spending it where it makes the most sense. Okay, a little bit about periodization planning, and uh, I wanted to talk about this just to show you where the different types of strength training may fit into the overall program. So for any of the QT2 athletes on the call, uh, most of you have seen these types of phases within your training program as you went through it over the, over the years. And uh, the first of those is a pre preparation phase. Now, typically the preparation phase is fairly informal, uh, lasts about a, a two-week period. And the purpose here from a strength perspective is to really just start gaining um, some of the soft tissue range of motion and stretch out that soft tissue. So many times you're doing the same moves that you'll plan to do later on in the program as you tend to increase the weight and uh, overall stress in the strength training program, except here you'll do them with very, very light weight just to get used to the ranges of motion and start stretching out that soft tissue. Um, next would be the base phase. And uh, typically from a strength perspective during the base phase, we're really focused on gaining strength. So this is where most of the work is done. Having said that, we're fairly far from race day at this point, so it's okay to be a little less sport specific. So here we're using some of the larger compound moves um, that stress large muscle groups and a lot of them that wants to be as efficient as we possibly can with it. This is where we're doing the strength training uh, in the free weight room. 
So that's usually the focus of, of the base phase. Then typically during the build phase, we're doing some sort of more sports-specific strength routine. Um, typically, the, the overall weight and stress of the program starts to reduce. And the reason why this is, is as we, as we continue through the build phase, we're starting to add quite a bit of stress now um, to our more sports-specific activities with our swimming, cycling, and running. Um, so we do want to start to scale back on how much stress we're adding in the weight room. Now, how much you do scale back in the overall strength program and how, how much you try to strike that balance between your sport-specific activities is really, again, dependent on the situation and how important we think sport-specific um, strength is or strength is overall in the athlete's program based on the athlete's specifics. Then typically we go into a, some sort of a peak phase, and during that peak phase it's really just about strength maintenance. Uh, you're no longer trying to continue to gain strength. You're just trying to maintain some of the strength that you gained earlier in the season. Um, and here we're starting to get very, very sports specific with the number of repetitions that we may be doing, much more functional type movements um, that are very similar to the actual sports activities, but they continue to provide that soft tissue flexibility and range of motion. Then typically we go into some sort of a taper, and uh, honestly during the taper we try to stay away from strength training altogether. Um, most tapers are two to three weeks in length, somewhere in that vicinity. It's not long enough where you're going to lose any specific amount of strength, um, and the risk of strength training during that period is probably higher than it's worth. Um, any strength training sessions completed during that final 14 to 20 days run the risk of impacting race day um, just because of the soft tissue damage that is done in a weight training type routine. So here's a typical periodization plan, and uh, I just wanted to show this to talk about where the various phases of strength training may fit into the overall program. So each week here is one bar. The height of the bar is based on the training volume of the week, and the various colors define different intensities and uh, also break out our different phases of training. So you'll notice that during the first 12-week period, uh, the color is fairly consistent all the way through there. And this is typically where we're doing our max strength work. You'll notice the first two weeks are very, very low. That's our preparatory phase. So this is where we're doing some of the larger compound movements, but with higher reps. Um, then we go into our max strength phase, which is about 10 weeks long in this case, where the athlete is trying to gain um, strength and uh, actually soft tissue durability and maybe even soft tissue mass in the gym by lifting heavy weights. And we typically try to dovetail that period for the athlete with slightly higher caloric intake and also slightly higher protein intake to really support the weight training and make sure we're reaching the objectives we have there. And again, that's okay because it is so far out from race day. It's not critical that we'd be that sport specific yet. Um, the next phase of training is uh, part of the build phase. So typically during this phase of training, we're doing some sort of sport-specific strength training. Um, we could switch right to very functional stuff if the athlete we don't think needs a specific amount of strength training. Um, but if we do think the athlete needs uh, strength training in their program based on their injury history, their age, um, so on and so forth, then we will include that uh, in there. But it is starting to become more sport-specific. And we'll see later on we get to some of those dark colors and those real high weeks, that real, that real high two-week period. During that period, we're definitely only doing functional strength training. We're typically using the TRX, just body weight-based exercises, core work, um, swim cords, trying to be very sport-specific with the movements that we're doing and really reducing the overall load of the strength training program. Because at that point, you really do have your hands full as a triathlete, and you're trying to handle... Um, all sorts of stress, swimming, biking, and running, and uh, at least at that time, it's, that's probably more important in terms of its direct impact on race day. <clears throat> so summarizing some of the things that I just talked about, I have each of the phases of training listed across the top of this table, and then along the left side, um, I have some of the objectives that we're really focusing on, and then what's going on in the program as we go through those training phases. So typically during the base phase, really focused on aerobic development and technique, and from a weight room or from a strength perspective. Um, we're typically in the weight room during that time. Uh, during the build phase, our sport focus is on very sport-specific strengths. It's very, very functional in nature. We're doing the hill repeats, low cadence work on the bike, uh, potentially paddle work in the pool. And from a strength training program perspective, we are focused more on strength specific. So does the athlete have particular needs related to um, strength training that we want to target at that time? Definitely being more functional in nature about it. 
Um, during the peak phase, we are switching to really just strength maintenance mode and just trying to maintain some of the strength that we gained earlier on in the program. And in many cases, we may get away from strength training altogether, um, especially during that final two to three week period before. This is before a major A race. Of course, you'll have races on the build up to that major race where you'll continue to strength train up to. But even in those cases, if the race is at the end of a recovery week, as an example, we'll typically try to keep the strength training at least uh, five to six days away from that, just because of the major damage that a heavy strength training program does to the soft tissue. It just takes time to um, recover from. So overall, as we go through those phases, you'll notice that the force of the strength training that you are doing is definitely decreasing. Um, overall rep ranges are increasing, so you're going from lifting very heavy weights at low repetition to lifting lighter weights at higher and higher repetition as you get closer to race day. But overall volume in the training program is generally increasing. Overall stress is generally increasing. As the body adapts to load during the first four to eight week period, um, we're continuing to eat, eat increase stress every four weeks or so. Um, to make sure that we're keeping a consistent relative load on the body as it adapts. And that's how we make progress at the end of the day. And again, here, you know, we're increasing sports specificity across the board as we work our way through the program. Okay, so talking a little bit about program design and assessment when it's, as it relates to strength training, um, one of the first steps is to assess your lean BMI. So the bottom line is strength a limiter for the athlete. And typically, I like to see lean BMI below 21 for the males and below 20 for the females. So the key is that this is lean BMI. It's after you adjust it for reaching your ideal body fat, okay? So even if your weight is presently 10 pounds over what that lean body body weight would be, um, you really need to use the lean adjusted body weight as you calculate BMI to make it valuable relative to muscle content. Um, if you do not do that, the BMI that you calculate will include a, a large percentage or some percentage of fat um, and therefore tell us less about overall muscle content. So that's why we lean strip it first and then calculate BMI. And these are the ideals. And typically, you know, if, if a male is below 21, female is below 20, we start to run the risk that strength is actually going to be a limiter for that athlete when it comes to our sports-specific activities. So in these cases, typically these athletes may be limited by strength on the bike. So we do work hard on an early strength training program, which is a lot of that max strength phase lifting that may go in 8 to 12 week period uh, early on in the season. And again, including quite a bit of protein and calorie surplus in that program to make sure that we are gaining some of that soft tissue strength. Um, these are also the athletes that we not only continue that early strength training program with for a longer period, um, but we also may continue to maintain a more significant um, non-sport specific strength training program throughout the season. Still though, as we get closer to race day, it's too essential to try to get it more <clears throat> uh, sport specific and functional, so we still do do that. We still definitely remove it during the final two to three week period before race day. <clears throat> Um, ne next would be whether or not the athlete is, is a male or a female. Generally, the females require a little bit more strength training than the males, um, <clears throat> particularly in the area of swimming. I mean, for, for most women, if they didn't grow up as a swimmer, um, strength is going to be a limiter in the pool. So a little bit more of a comprehensive strength training program is required there. Now, you know, a lot of that uh, very pool-specific strength may be targeted early on in the program while we're in the gym lifting heavy weights, but then later on we'll keep a somewhat significant amount of paddle work in the pool and or band swimming uh, for the females just to maintain, we may, make sure we maintain that strength uh, and continue to gain it. Because in this case, strength may actually be a limiter for their swim speed directly. Okay? Um, next would be age. Generally for women over 40 years old or, or men over 50, strength really starts to become a limiter really, really quick. And uh, sure, there's some exceptions where the athlete has started with a fairly high lean BMI, but eventually strength will catch up with that athlete, and that's what will ultimately be their limiter. So uh, if you fall into these demographics, it's not a bad idea to be very proactive with your strength training program and continue to include a significant amount of it uh, as you continue to move forward and consider keeping a significant amount of strength training um, within the program throughout the entire season. Sure, it's going to moderate where, where you go from uh, max strength work in the gym to more functional stuff later, but you may increase the number of sessions. You may continue to keep some of the non-sport specific strength training that's coming in the weight room in there for a longer period before you switch to more functional stuff. Um, overall, there should be a, a, a much larger focus on strength training in the overall program. 
Next would be injury history. Um, so has the athlete had Achilles tendonitis in the past? This typically means that there's some gastroc and soleus strength issues. Has the athlete had lower back pain? Has the, has the athlete had hamstring issues? So understanding all of that is super important in developing the strength training program because you may choose specific exercises to target those areas so that we wipe that off the table as a potential issue or limiter uh, during the next season. That's always the goal. Um, and lastly, mechanics analysis, and this is typically best done with, uh, with video, but doing video run mechanics and video swim mechanics can help assess where there may be specific strength deficiencies within the athlete's uh, very sport-specific mechanics. And they were able to actually target uh, those areas with the strength training program. And that's typically mostly done once we get to more of the functional stuff. Um, early on in the season when we're doing max strength work, uh, there typically isn't enough time or value in the program to really working on that stuff in a very intense way, unless there's a major issue. Um, again, you can't do everything all at once. Uh, triathlon is all about being a balancing act. And, um, you know, very similar to the sports-specific stuff. If you want to improve your bike, you can't expect to uh, continue to improve your, your, your swim and your run. Um, you have to give something to get something. It's the same thing here. If we try to do everything at once in the weight room, um, not only will we probably suffer uh, in terms of our strength, but our swimming, biking, and running will definitely suffer. Um, so it's sort of one thing at a time, and patience is the name of the game, as usual. So the key here is to assess the athlete limiters, and uh, that's what needs to dictate the strength training program at the end of the day. It's not just a one-size-fits-all, you know, here's a strength training program and it works for everybody. You know, how much of that strength training program you put into the, into the overall training program should be very specific on the person. <clears throat> so what are some common deficiencies in athletes? Um, here I've listed out a few that uh, are worth working on in a proactive nature, and um, for the QT2 athletes, we typically try to include some sort of a strength routine throughout the program, targeting some of these key areas that are almost always an issue uh, in triathletes. So the first one would be rotational core strength. Um, the next one would be lower back, and typically the lower back strength is related to the hamstrings. So athletes that have pain in the lower back and or hamstrings typically just want to strengthen both and tighten and you know strengthen that whole area. Um, because once one gets weak, it starts to depend on the other a little bit more, and then we end up with pain. Um, next would be hip abductors and rotators. Just because triathlon is such a linear sport, meaning we're always moving forward, um, really no side-to-side -side movement like you would get in a sport like basketball. Um, athletes typically get very, very weak from a lateral perspective. And the problem is that these are very supportive type muscle groups that allow us to get the proper and efficient run mechanics positions. And that's probably the most applicable example. Um, but not having strength in these areas really makes the run mechanics sloppy. And at the end of the day, it slows the athletes down. So we want to maintain that lateral strength. Next would be the scapular stabilizers. So these are all of the small muscle groups around the shoulder. And uh, the, having strength in these areas really allows you to get into an effective catch position in the pool and uh, also go through the full range of motion with an effective pull and create effective propulsion while swimming. So that's why it's important to maintain good scapular stabilizer strength there. And at the end of the day, we're really trying to strengthen that stuff to get into a mechanically efficient position and be able to engage the larger muscle group, which are the lats in this case. Okay, so here I'm going to walk through the various types and phases of training that we may go through and talk about the purpose of each one. Um, so first I'm going to talk about the preparation phase, also known as uh, the adaptation phase. The whole purpose of this phase is to begin strengthening and stretching that soft tissue, as I mentioned earlier. It's really about preparing for the harder work to come during the max strength phase. We'd like athletes to just go through the motions, and honestly, most athletes approach this phase of training on, if they do it on their own much, much too heavy. Somebody takes on a strength training program, they typically want to rush it. Day one, they are practically going to failure. Then they are so sore the next day they can't lift for a week, and they are so sore that they can't swim, bike, or run for a week. So the preparation phase is all about going super, super light. And I usually recommend to athletes, literally for the first session, do not put any weight on the exercises that you're doing. Just going through the range of motion will be enough stress to actually have you be sore the next day. Um, so in general, there's no warm-up required for these exercises because basically the whole routine is a warm-up uh, if we're not using any weight during the early sessions. Um, typically, these, these types of workouts should be completed about three times a week, so that's another reason why we're not do going super heavy uh, during those sessions. We may be in the gym three days a week with only a day separated by each. Okay? 
Um, the rest time between sets for this phase of training only needs to be about a minute and a half. Again, we're not doing max strength type lifts here, so it's not imperative that we're 100% recovered um, for each set. It's more about preparing the soft tissue. So with that, you know, overall each workout should only take about 30 to 40 minutes, no longer than that. Um, you know, another big issue that I think is quite common in athletes is they take on a strength routine and they think they need to be in the gym for an hour, hour and a half, two hours. And for a triathlete, that's just not practical. It's not a prudent way to spend the availability of stress that you have in your program. Um, you're much, much better off having the strength training program be targeted and efficient using compound movements, which engage as many muscle groups as possible, and then getting out of there and spending more time swimming, biking, and running. Um, that's the bottom line. And, you know, generally once you go beyond 60 minutes, the, the hormonal response isn't positive and you could actually start um, undermining the purpose of the session in the first place, which is to gain strength. So rep range during the preparation or adaptation phase is about 15 to 20 reps and about three sets per move. Going into this max strength phase here, so this is the, the meat and potatoes of the strength training program. This is where we're really looking to make some gains. So the, perfect, the purpose of the strength phase is to get strong. Um, and we're trying to use semi-functional type movements here that, again, try to target some of the main muscle groups that we expect to use in triathlon and be efficient while doing it. Um, for this phase of training, it becomes very, very important to make sure you warm up very well um, before you exercise, just because we're going so heavy here. So that's why it's uh, imperative to do that. Um, also, with the weight of the exercises, uh, we're increasing the rest time here to three minutes. The purpose of having that three minutes in there is to ensure that you fully recover from each set that you do so that you give the next set uh, your absolute very best and lift heavy weights. That's the purpose of the space. And, you know, many triathletes don't realize that it's valuable to lift like this. They seem to think for some reason that, um, well, I'm a triathlete, I don't need to lift heavy, I'm just going to go in and do 20 reps all the time. And uh, at the end of the day, you're able to actually increase strength much more efficiently, lifting heavier weights. Um, the, the recruitment of muscle fibers is much more effective with heavier weights. And the overall durability of the soft tissue that you get out of it is much more effective. Okay, so that's why we approach it. And thankfully, we have the luxury of doing this type of training when it's far from race day because it is very unrace specific. Okay, so typically these max strength workouts are completed about twice a week, and they are very, very stressful, getting very close to, to maximum weights we're lifting. Okay? So with that, the rep range is, is very um, short relative to the preparation phase. We're talking about 4 to 12 reps for each move that you do, and then doing three sets per move. So now we'll talk about the functional strength phase. The purpose of the functional strength phase is to continue to maintain the strength gained earlier in the gym and target a very sport-specific uh, muscle weaknesses if you have them that may have been found via the mechanics and or injury history. So here again, getting much more functional in nature. Uh, you may still be in the gym, but you can also do a lot of this stuff at home uh, depending on the particular situation. And it's a much more targeted program focusing on some of your specific strength, specific weaknesses, I should say. Um, so some examples that you could use at home would be using the TRX or the push-ups, sit-ups, stretch bands, swim cords, or other body-loaded exercises. Um, and generally the, the rep range here is 12 to 20 reps. So we're starting to reduce the amount of stress that we're applying to the soft tissue because at this point uh, the overall training load from our swim, cycling, and running sessions is definitely increasing. So we want to be careful on how much stress we're spending in the gym. Um, so we'll also scale back the overall load of the program in just two sets per exercise. And then sport-specific strength. So the sport-specific strength can really be used any time throughout the year to gain in-sport strength or transition strength gained in the gym um, into, into the sport itself. So our examples here, again, are hill bounding outside while running, paddle work in the pool, or low cadence work on the bike. These are great ways to continue to maintain strength in a very, very sport-specific way and transition some of the strength you may have gained in the gym into these more sport-specific movements. Okay? It can also be used as a, as a strength maintenance tool between gym sessions, um, depending on when those gym sessions occur throughout the season. Um, so all, all of the moves that are related to the sport-specific strength phase are done in the sports move. So it's done on the bike, it's done on, in your run sneakers, and it's done in the pool. And we're talking very, very high rep here, right? It's, you know, it's hundreds of repetitions during a particular workout. 
Okay, so starting to address some of the mechanics. Um, first, I'm going to address run mechanics and then swim mechanics. Some of the key flexibilities related to run mechanics are soleus flexibility and psoas slash upper quad flexibility. So these are primary areas. Because triathletes spend so much time in the aero bars, this area of the upper quad and psoas tends to get extremely tight um, and then hamper our ability to run well off the bike because we simply can't get into mechanically efficient positions while running. Um, also, this area of the soleus and calf tends to get very tight again because of the bike and having your, your foot and the angle at your ankle be in a very static position. Um, the best way to assess that one is to squat down in bare feet, pushing your butt towards your heels. And if your heels are off the ground when you do that, it typically means you have soleus inflexibility. So best addressed with some sort of stretching and or eccentric calf raises. We really like eccentric calf raises to target that soleus flexibility. Um, with the psoas and upper quad area, um, can be addressed with stretching and some of the TRX moves, which I'm going to go over shortly. Um, a lot of those moves can be used to, to double as not only strength training exercises, but also stretching exercises. So the key with st stretching the psoas and upper quad is to really focus on a two-joint type stretch, where we have angle change at the hip and angle change down at the knee. So some of the key strengths related to run mechanics. Soleus, again, is on the list, targeted the same way with the eccentric calf raises. That rotational core strength, best targeted with bicycle crunches or any sort of twisting motion type abdominal strength exercises. Um, standing rows can be effective and also planks. Um, the glute medius, which is a, a lateral strength uh, area. Single leg squats are fantastic for that as long as we don't let the non-loaded side drop also monster walks. And we'll go over some examples of these again in a, in a few minutes. Um, the TFL and abduction in general, typically identified if you see a runner with the knees caving inward and or hip drop, um, but best addressed with abductors with a cable in the gym using a low pulley and Velcro band around the ankle. You could also use stretch band to do that exercise. Um, then the vastus medialis, this is the inner quad basically. The outer quad typically gets very strong from all the cycling that we do and the inner quad can tend to get neglected a little bit. That's targeted with leg extensions and uh, just slightly pointing the toes outward to target that area. Careful not to point too far outward and put stress on the knee, but just a slight point outward can, can really engage the vastus medialis. Um, then the psoas and upper quad, again, here is a strength issue, and it's no surprise that the soleus and psoas and upper quad are both on my key flexibilities list and key strengths list, um, because typically a weak muscle is a tight muscle. So, um, you know, the, the, the fact that they're tight is probably because they're weak, and that's why they become important under this strength topic. So with that area, uh, the psoas and upper quad, the hip flexor march with a stretch band works well. Also, power cranks are a pretty effective tool to target this area. Um, and then lastly, you know, balance in general when it comes to run mechanics and triathletes is typically a limiter. Um, so we want to do exercises or moves that try to enhance our balance. And here's an example of one of my athletes with a fairly significant hip drop. Um, it's due to left hip weakness. This is the, the TFL area, uh, the glute medius area that's potentially weak on the left side, causing that right side um, to drop. And you'll notice he's leaning over with his upper torso to the left in an effort to counterbalance that weakness that he has. So that's not too uncommon to see in triathletes. So transitioning here to swim mechanics, some of the key flexibilities and key strengths that are required. Uh, under key flexibilities, we have the pectoral area, the triceps, the delts, and the lats. This whole area um, is just really important to keep flexible to continue to maintain good swim mechanics. And uh, you know, you can train in the pool all you want and apply all sorts of training stress, but at the end of the day, if you can't strike the right mechanics due to range of motion, um, you're not going to get much faster. You're going to be significantly limited by this in the water. So what are some of the key strengths that are required? Strength of the deltoids, which is typically targeted with TRX work and or shoulder raises in the gym using free weights with dumbbells. Um, the lats, which is our primary mover muscle here, um, best targeted with swim cords or lat pushdowns or some of the TRX exercises. Um, also core strength, again, addressed with the rotational core strength. So, you know, you hear people talk about core all the time, and you can see why, because it's on both lists. It's on this list, then it's the run mechanics list. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, 
that area of your body is really rich in soft tissue. The only thing that connects really your upper torso to your lower body is that core area, and it's also the only part of your body where you really don't have a solid bone uh, other than your spine going through the area. So you really focus on uh, or depend on the soft tissue strength or core strength in that area to facilitate some of our sports-specific movements. Um, next will be the scapular stabilizers. Again, strengthen in this area with the swim cords, TRX, rows, or push-ups. Um, really just strengthening that whole area to make sure that uh, we're not impacting swim mechanics because of uh, weakness in those areas. Um, and lastly would be traps, uh, which are typically best targeted with the TRX. Most moves that you do in the gym that concern the upper body are going to engage the traps to some degree, um, some more effective by, than others. But doing some of the TRX exercises or some of the upper body gym moves will certainly target the traps. So here's a, an underwater swimmer. You'll notice a major crossover here on the right side. Typically, this type of crossover can be due to shoulder weakness on that side and the inability to keep the arm in an effective catch position as we engage the lats and start to apply pressure um, to the water. So that's just one example of that, a potential deficiency in terms of strength of the shoulder. So where do we put strength training in a program? Um, typically during the base phase where we're lifting very heavy in the gym, I typically like these sessions to be the day before more significant run days. Um, if you do put it on a bike day, the strength sessions should definitely be after the bike session. Um, the other option is to put it the day of the run session, but after the run workout. I typically don't favor that unless I have to in terms of scheduling, just because the run session itself is going to apply quite a bit of stress and maybe limit our ability to lift heavy weights in the gym, which again, the purpose of this max strength phase is to, is to be able to lift heavy. An example, build week. So here we're doing much more functional type work, uh, a TRX session. Typically, I like to put these the day of run sessions, but I put it after the run workout. And the purpose there is sort of uh, multiple. Typically, having the TRX sessions in there after runs tends to open up um, some of the muscle groups that have gotten very tight during the run session. When you're out there running for an hour, 90 minutes, two hours, um, the, the range of motion while running in some of these areas is very, very limited, therefore causes these areas to get very tight. Um, an example would be that psoas region and upper quad. So getting on the TRX, um, which has multi-use, can tend to open up some of those areas. And, you know, I keep bringing up the TRX. The reason why I like the TRX for this phase of training is that the TRX is sort of uh, multi-purpose. Obviously, it targets some strength. Um, it also targets flexibility through some of the moves. And lastly, it targets balance. So it's very efficient for triathletes and also travels very, very well. And in fact, you know, some athletes that um, are very high on the lean BMI side, we, we definitely don't want to add additional muscle to. Um, it's not uncommon for us to actually just use TRX all the way through the season and not ever even go into a max strength type lifting phase, okay? So typically these t functional exercises like the TRX or swim cords are, are put after the day session. So for the TRX be after run sessions. Um, for the swim cords, we would use those after a major swim session. So just a word on safety here, you know, know yourself if you're a coach, know your athletes, make sure you're comfortable or that your athlete is comfortable doing the exercises, that they actually know how to do the exercises safely and effectively without getting injured. Um, if you're unsure of doing some of these exercises or not sure how to do them properly without getting injured, um, you know, grab, grab one of the professionals at your gym and have them show you how to do some of these moves. Um, make sure that you have a spotter for any free weight exercises. It's tremendously dangerous to do free weight exercises without having a spotter. Um, you know, the, just understand your potential for injury during weight training also. You know, if, if you're an older athlete, um, typically this demographic runs a slightly higher risk of becoming injured during weight training because some of the stabilizing muscles aren't quite as developed any longer and there's some joint instabilities that may be present and can cause uh, potential danger to safety. Um, also understand any past injuries that you may have had. Obviously, if you've had knee surgery in the past, be particularly cautious of any exercise that engage that area. Um, at the end of the day, it's about understanding the movements and understanding the safe ranges of motion um, that your body can handle given who you are and your demographic. So make sure you warm up very, very well for any of the exercises, particularly the strength training phase where we're in the gym lifting max weights. Um, make sure you warm up very, very well for those sessions so that we reduce the risk of injury. Um, and at the end of the day, like I said, never spend more than 60 minutes in the gym. Think about your overall stress budget. Most triathletes between their day job, 
their family and their training regimen have a, a very limited stress budget. Um, so just be cognizant of where to spend it. And typically for the triathlete, it's not worth spending more than 60 minutes in the gym on any particular session. Okay, so here I'm going to run through some example sessions. Um, you'll notice that some of these exercises have the word video to the right. These are just uh, exercises that I'm actually going to go through the video on here towards the end of the presentation. I'm going to go through all the sessions first and then come back and go through some of the videos. Okay. So the first one would be the hack squat. This is during the preparation phase. Next would be lat pull down, the leg press, seated row, leg extension, and hamstring curl. Again, these are all fairly compound movements, at least the first four are. They're movements that most people should probably use in their max strength phase lifting. Um, so we engage those immediately during the preparation or adaptation phase to get used to some of those ranges of motion. Um, as I stated, the rep range is very high during this phase of training with very light weight. We're typically doing the lightest set first and then getting heavier and sort of easing into the movements here. Okay? Next is the max strength phase. Here I'm using, again, some of the similar movements compared to what we just saw. You notice this core strength um, circuit that I have in the middle, and I, I like to do this as, as just that, a circuit where the athlete goes from back extensions immediately to sit-ups, and immediately to some other type of core strengthening exercise. And the type of exercise you use during this core strength program isn't really too important. The main thing is to make sure you engage the core, the lower back, the abdominals, and if possible, include some sort of a twisting motion, which makes it more functional relative to triathlon. <clears throat> but I like to do this as a continuous circuit where the athlete goes through it three times with, with no rest at all. Um, because these exercises are core in nature, hitting some of the smaller muscle groups, it's not as imperative to have very long rest times in between sets. Um, you're not lifting max, max weight while doing these core strain sessions, so it's more efficient to just walk through that fairly quickly. <clears throat> You notice that the overall rep ranges that I have for most of the primary movements here are very, very low. Again, we're lifting heavy weight here. It's the max strength phase. Um, so if I look at leg press as the example, I'm doing four reps during the first set, which will be my heaviest um, set of, of that particular exercise, then six reps the next set, and then eight reps the next set, and actually getting lighter as I go through this. Usually you'll see strength training programs arranged in the other direction. I've always liked to do the heaviest set first, it's when you're fresh, you're not fatigued yet, so it gives you the best shot at lifting the heaviest weight that you possibly can during that particular set. The caveat to that is you need to warm up very, very well because you're jumping into the heaviest set first. You need to make sure that your body and your joints are prepared to do that. So um, that warm-up is super, super important. Next would be the functional strength phase. Um, I have an example TRX routine here. You see the ones that I'm going to go over a video here in a moment on. Um, then I have a gym, a gym routine that's related to functional strength, doing single leg hack lunge, and uh, I don't have a video of that one, but it is a great exercise, um, a little bit more sports specific. The lat push down, which I'll show a video of, which is a great, very swim specific exercise that can be done in the gym, um, and the single leg squat. And then if you want to do the functional strength at home, that's possible too. Um, the monster walk is great where you connect uh, a stretch band to both ankles and walk laterally across your living room as an example. Um, and then abductors with the stretch band and also the two-joint hip flexor stretch. We can't forget that one in terms of creating flexibility in that psoas upper quad region. And during this phase of training, all exercises can be done of two sets of, two, of 12 reps. Okay, so definitely lighter weight, mostly body weight based, just trying to maintain strength and or target some of the particular um, areas of concern that the athlete may have. And an example sport-specific strength session. So this is our, you know, paddle work in the pool, low cadence on the bike, and hill bounding running. Um, paddle work in the pool, I have an example session there. Then low cadence work on the bike using 10-minute repeats at 55 to 60 RPMs. And lastly, hill bounding running. Um, for those of you that haven't seen hill bounding, we're going to take a look at video of that um, so you can see what that looks like. But generally, somewhere between 5 to 12 repeats on a one-minute hill, well, hill bounding. Okay, so that, those were all the slides that I was going to go through on the presentation here tonight. Next, we're going to take a look at um, some of the actual videos and examples of these videos um, that I showed in some of the sessions that were example sessions. So first, we're going to take a look at the hack squat. So I, I really like the hack squat. It, it's 
although it's used during the max strength phase of lifting, it is a little bit more sport specific in nature. A hack position means that I have the foot planted in a location that's ahead of the torso. This allows us to engage the glutes a little bit more effectively and improve hip extension power, um, which is essential to cycling strength. So that's why we like to do our squats in a hack position versus uh, just totally linear. Um, what's shown here is hack squat done on a Smith machine. This actually isn't my preferred method of doing hack squats. It's safer generally to do it on the hack squat machine. The thing is that most gyms don't have the hack squat machine. Only about one in four or one or five actually have that hack squat machine, um, which typically has a pad that's at the bottom, and then the shoulder pads are above, and they come down on your shoulders, and that's where the weight is applied. It's actually the opposite orientation of the leg press. So you may have one of those in your gym, but it generally is a little bit safer. This particular move, just be careful with. Um, it tends to apply a lot of stress to the lower back. Taking a look at lat pull down. This is a very traditional strength training exercise. Um, not super sport specific, but definitely improves the strength of the lats, which is a primary mover muscle uh, for triathlon swimming or for swimming in general. Um, but it's a nice full range of motion coming all the way down to the chest, making sure that you're not moving the upper torso. So staying nice and steady here. Sometimes you'll see people in the gym who are, who are swinging the weight backwards and swinging their upper body backwards, and you don't want to be doing that. You want to stay fairly stable there uh, in the upper torso, bring the weight straight down to your chest. Okay. Next is the seated row, and uh, with the seated row, I like to use a very full range of motion um, where the athlete reaches all the way forward, and the reason why I like to do this is it really engages the lower back as well. You know, sticking with our theme of efficiency, um, we want to try to engage as many muscle groups as we can with the exercise we do to keep the strength training program very efficient. So I do like to reach all the way forward to engage the lower back and the hamstrings, and then the key is to make sure that at the top of the motion, um, we stop the movement of the upper torso and that we're able to pull the shoulders back and push the chest forward. As long as the athlete is able to do that, um, they're probably using the appropriate weight. Athletes who can't pop that chest forward and push the shoulders back are probably using too much weight. So the key again is to, to reach all the way forward but make sure you stop the motion there at the top right at about 90 degrees and pull the weight right into your tummy. And here's the single leg squat. This is a rare exercise to ever see anyone do in the gym, but it's tremendously effective, I think, related to run mechanics and run strength. So you'll notice we're on a step here with the ball of our foot, allowing the heel to drop at the bottom of the motion. And then at the top of the motion, extending all the way up onto the ball of the foot and really engaging the soleus and the gastroc in here, okay? And also improving the soft tissue tendon strength here, the Achilles, which is absolutely key. So this goes a long way. Um, to providing some injury resilience as you get into the meat of the season and do some of those sessions that um, will make you faster for race day and having the ability to do those without getting injured. Okay, So that's the key there. Um, the other key component here in terms of the, uh, the, the posture when doing this exercise, make sure here you know, we're working the left side of the body, but just make sure that the left hip doesn't drop while doing this. By restraining that motion, you really strengthen the right hip, which is the exact type functional strength that we want to target with run mechanics to avoid any sort of hip drop like that. And now we're getting to some of the more functional exercises that can be done in the gym. Here's the lat push down. So now you're standing in front of the lat pull down machine, getting into a very swim specific type posture, keeping a nice high elbow. And you can see here at mid pull, this is very, very swim specific and all the way down, full range of motion. So it's a great exercise. Another one that you won't see people doing very often in the gym, um, but it is very applicable to swimming and, and strength training for triathlon. But make sure you keep the proper posture when doing this. Keep a nice high elbow. Picture yourself uh, being horizontal in this position and catching the water. Um, that's the key to this exercise, to make it very functional.
Now going on to our very functional type exercises. This is the TRX connected to a, a wood apparatus in, in a backyard. Um, but this can really be done anywhere. It can be done in your backyard, connected to a tree. You could connect it to a door inside your house. You could set up a hook in your basement and connect it to that. It's very versatile. Um, this one is the single leg squat, this particular exercise. So this exercise is very similar to that, that hack squat that I showed earlier, obviously with less load, continuing to maintain strength later in the season. Also requires quite a bit of balance to do this properly, which is all good things. But you can see here we're engaging the glute, again in that somewhat hack position, which engages the glute more effectively, improves hip extension power. Um, we have the balance component in there and obviously some quad strength as we have the extension occur at the knee. And that's what that looks like. Okay, next is the sprint or start. This is a much more dynamic move and a little bit more explosive in nature. It's not bad to have some of this type of strength training in, in a runner's program uh, to provide some injury resilience and stimulate some soft tissue strength. Now, you'll notice at the bottom of the motion, um, it's somewhat important here to lean into it with the torso. You'll notice that it's certainly opening up this region of the upper quad and so as it's providing flexibility there. Now, that's a key area where triathletes tend to get tight because of all the cycling time. So you can see how the, the TRX becomes a fairly efficient tool because here I'm getting a good stretch component out of this exercise before I've even done anything regarding strength. And then as we go forward here, it's a very explosive dynamic move. We drive the knee through, engage the glute on the left side and quad and maintain strength there. You'll notice I'm also bouncing off the toe. So we're incorporating some and engaging some of the glute strength and soleus strength. So again, multi-muscle um, group type exercise, compound in nature. Uh, it's dynamic and includes a, a stretch component, so really efficient in that way for triathletes. And here's the TRX suspended lunge. This one is similar to the sprint to start in terms of its purpose. So it's about opening up the flexibility of the psoas and upper quad. It has a very, very significant balance component. For those of you that may have tried this in the past, I'm sure the first time you did it, you had some trouble. But eventually you get your balance, and, and that's an important characteristic to have in a runner, um, making sure that you have good balance. You also notice that my upper body, I like to use um, the actual run mechanics position, so trying to keep it very sport specific. Um, by having the arms do the right thing in the upper torso. And of course we do have a strength component here as well um, with the quad and glute on the left side in this example. Here's a great uh, more swim specific exercise. It's the standing Y. So this engages the upper back, the traps, and uh, the deltoid. So one of the most swim specific I think strengthening exercises that I know of. I really like this one for athletes that are particularly strength limited uh, in the water. This targets all the right things when it comes to the sport specific strength requirements of swimming. And of course it doesn't engage the lats directly, which is your primary movement muscle with swimming, but some of the more peripheral items that allow you to get into positions are targeted here. Continuing to get more and more functional with the exercises, here are some swim cords, and I just have the swim cords connected to the TRX. I just like to do it that way. You, of course, don't need to have the TRX to have swim cords. Um, you could buy swim cords and connect them to something in your house, uh, a banister or something like that. Um, but here, here's a uh, very swim-specific strength cord routine or swim cord routine where we're first doing an exercise that's the front half of the stroke. So keeping the palms perpendicular to the body, creating a nice high elbow early on in the exercise, and then stopping at mid-pull. So it's the first half of a catch and pull. Um, again, keeping it very par parallel or perpendicular in this case to the body, keeping the palm perpendicular to the body, nice high elbow, um, getting that palm into a position that's effective or would be effective if you were in the water, um, getting that vertical forearm early on in the stroke, which are all very, very important characteristics to a good swim stroke. So it provides strength in all of these areas, provides flexibility and overall mobility of the joint area. And at the end of the day, you know, many athletes can't get into these positions in the water. It's important that you're able to do it on dry land first. If you can't get into these positions on dry land, your chances of being able to do it in the water are quite slim. 
And here's the second half of that move. So this is starting where the last one ended. You really can't do the full range of motion because you run out of resistance in the cords. So here we choke up and we actually start where the last one ended with that nice high elbow. And here we finish out the back of the stroke. So you'll notice the palm stays perpendicular to the body the whole way through. And, uh, you know, really practicing that swim mechanics at the same time getting some strength out of it. And at the back end, you'll notice following through with the stroke, engaging the tricep, and continuing to push water all the way past the hip. Okay. And lastly, I'm just going to show a video of hill bounding. For those of you that haven't seen hill bounding done before, um, you can see what it looks like here. So with hill bounding, you're, oops, I'm sorry, this is the two joint hip flexor stretch. So we'll go through this anyhow. Um, this is an important exercise to see. This is the two joint hip flexor stretch, which really opens up that psoas and upper quad area. If you don't have a TRX, which really targeted some of these areas, um, this is the best stretch for it. And I'll just show it one more time. Typically when athletes um, start with this exercise, they have to start with a towel because they don't have the range of motion yet, but you're grabbing the ankle with the opposite arm and then reaching over the body with the other arm. And that really targets and opens up that upper quad and psoas area. So that's the most effective stretch for run mechanics generally, especially for triathletes that are chronically tight in this area. And I just wanted to grab the, the hill bounding video. Just bear with me here a moment. And here's hill bounding. So with hill bounding, you're really trying to increase the load on some of these key uh, run soft tissue areas and improve the durability and strength of those areas and overload them with the dynamic movement. So whereas you're typically um, trying to run up a hill in a race or to be more efficient and really shortening the stride length, with hill bounding you're doing the opposite. You're trying to increase the vertical bounce, you're trying to increase the stride length and really overload some of those soft tissue areas and develop some of the very sports specific strength requirements. So it's actually a very, very stressful type repeat to do. Um, generally start with like five the first workout, and then we work our way up to as much as 10 or 12 for the more advanced athletes. But generally done on a one minute hill and making sure you take three to four minutes between repeats to recover. This isn't an exercise where you do a hill repeat like you normally do hill repeats and then quickly run down to the bottom and do another repeat. You need to take a break between each one um, to make sure that the next one is as effective as it could be. And that was hill bounding. So that, that's everything that I plan to cover tonight. Uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to enter them in the questions box, and I'll spend as much time as required to answer those questions. Right, right now, I don't see any questions in the box. I could also answer questions in the chat if anyone has any questions that they want to ask. Okay, we have a couple questions coming in. Okay, first question is regarding Joe Friel. Um, has a body to weight ratio. What is max weight one should go up to? Um, there's no magical formula for that. Um, in general, as long as you're able to hit the recommended or targeted rep ranges with a the weight, then the next session you should probably increase the weight. And you continue to do that until you don't make the recommended rep range. If you don't make it on one particular session, then the next session you use the same weight that you used the previous session. Um, until you do make the weight for that number of repetitions, and then you move up again. That's a simple way um, to increase weight as you go forward throughout your strength training program and continue to provide strength or stress to the muscle tissue and continue to make progress in the strength training program. Next question is regarding strength workouts like yoga or Pilates. The, the person is asking if they have value. And it really depends on the situation. We very, very rarely prescribe yoga or Pilates. 
Um, the only time I'll prescribe those if the athlete has particular issues that are related to some of the peripheral muscles and or core strength and or flexibilities in general. I'm not saying yoga or Pilates is a bad thing to do because they're actually really good things to do. The thing is you have to, again, balance that stress budget and decide if it's worthwhile in an overall triathlon training program. And in most cases, these types of workouts apply more stress than it's worth. That, that stress is typically worth swimming, biking, and running as a more valuable area to spend it. Um, so, you know, having said that, if you get later into the program where you're just doing more functional strength maintenance type stuff, that may be a period where you can replace the strength training program with Pilates and or yoga. And those two are very different things, too, I should say. You know, yoga is much more focused on flexibility, whereas Pilates, depending on the instructor you go to, can be much more focused on core strength. Next question is, if you do a different weight exercise instead of waiting for the three minutes of rest, is this okay? The only time you'd want to do that uh, is if you're in a time crunch and um, we're mixing between lower body exercise and upper body exercise. So if you do a lower body exercise and you don't want to wait the three minutes or you don't have time, then go to one of the upper body exercises to let your lower body recover. It's not ideal, but you can get away with it if you're in a time crunch. It's better than skipping the session altogether. The reason why I say it's not ideal is the blood that you've pulled down to the legs or lower body to do those particular exercises then has to move its way to back to the upper body when you do the upper body exercise and so on and so forth. So um, the best way to cheat any of those times would be to do your three sets of leg press as an example. The next exercise an upper body exercise. So do not wait the three minutes after that last set of the lower body exercise. Move directly to the upper body exercise. You can save a little bit of time that way. If I miss a workout and a few days go by before I lift, I always get sore. Is this common? Uh, this is well into a strength lifting routine. Um, the answer is yes. You know, if, if you miss any significant period of time, you know, it's amazing how quickly your muscles forget the ranges of motion and some of the loads that you apply in the gym. Um, so you can certainly still have soreness even if you're deep into a weight training program after taking only five or six days off. Okay. Next question, do you worry about injuring shoulders with paddles? Some people say that that's a problem. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's all um, relative to how you approach it and how quickly you increase your stress. So sure, there's plenty of athletes that have had injuries using paddles. It probably means they did not do a strength training program during their early season. It probably means they add way too much paddle stress much too quickly with much too large of a paddle. So as long as you increase stress logically and your body adapts to the load, it's not a problem at all. And that's where we actually get the strength from. You know, typically the things that injure people are the things that also make them stronger. The problem is they were, they were too um, uh, inpatient to increase the stress properly in a logical way, so they rush to it too quickly, and therefore the item that applies load that would strengthen them over the long term actually applies load and injures them because they added it too quickly. Okay. Can swim cord exercises be done as one motion, or should they be done in two separate exercises? Typically done in two separate exercises, as I mentioned, only because you run out of swim cord length to do the full exercise, and you start to really vary the amount of resistance that you may be getting during different phases of that motion. Um, so that's why we break it into two, to get the, the full um, range of motion with consistent, somewhat consistent resistance across the whole thing. Next question is, I worry about losing strength on the bike by only doing sports-specific workouts. Should I incorporate more weights? Um, you know, depending on the demographic, and I do know the person who's asking this question, and this person is in the demographic where uh, they are a woman and they are a little bit older, um, we should certainly be maintaining, I think, a strength training program throughout the season for this particular athlete. So it's not only doing that comprehensive max strength type lifting early in the season, but that continuing on the TRX uh, throughout the season or maybe even one uh, gym to session. And uh, that will help maintain strength throughout the season and, you know, maybe even continuing that up until three weeks out from the major race day, okay? And, you know, if you do not fit into that demographic and or if your BMI is above 20 for a female or 21 for a male, it's definitely not necessary to do that. Next question, with the hip drop pick that you showed, my right heel kicks in at the top of the recovery. My right calf, I cannot stretch as deep as the left. Is this the reason for happening or is it a strength issue with some muscles? 
that is a very, very difficult one to solve. It gets very complicated and deep-rooted in the run mechanics. And honestly, even when I do run mechanics sessions, many times we can't solve that one. Um, my general philosophy in a lot of these situations where you can't directly relate it to something is to make sure that you take care of the things you do know how to fix. And chances are, if you do that, it'll take care of the other stuff. So if you know your right calf is not as flexible, fix it. It can only help, and maybe it does end up cleaning up the other issue. Okay, I think I've answered all questions that are in the questions box. If nobody has any additional questions, I appreciate the attention tonight and uh, sitting through the webinar. This will be recorded or it has been recorded. It will be posted um, to the client area on the QT2 site for viewing by our clients. And again, I appreciate the attention. If anyone has any suggestions on future webinars, feel free to enter, enter them into the Contact Us box on the QT2 website, and we'll do our best to accommodate those. We generally try to do a webinar about once a month.